glory to the name of the Lord. Galatians 3, verses 22 through 29. I have it on the screen behind me for the benefit of those of us in the sanctuary this afternoon. The word of the Lord reads from the King James text, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now listen. For many, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk to us for a while today. Talk about clingy. Talk about clingy. <laughs> if you bow your heads with me one moment, Father, once again, Lord, we come boldly before the throne of grace. As the Word of God declares it our privilege as children of the Most High God. Already, Lord, standing in this pulpit today, I feel a unique and wonderful anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, I believe, Lord, today. Uh, mm, oh, Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. The Word of God declares, I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, open the Word of God for us today. Lord, open it wide that we might see clearly. Open our eyes that we might understand and receive what you would speak to us by the Holy Ghost today. Touch the preacher. Help me, God, to deliver the Word of the Lord. Lord, I know... I know for a fact that I cannot do this job without you. I know that, God. I, I am no fool. I know, God, we need the anointing, the touch of the Holy Ghost, if the Word of God is to be effective. And today, Lord, I believe you want to speak to your people. I need to be effective. I need to be heard. I need to be understood. I need to be clear. Oh God, help us this hour to both deliver and to receive the word of the Lord with gladness. That it might bring help and healing to our soul. That our faith might grow. And that we might be further empowered to go out from this place, from wherever we may be. 
and be a witness and a testimony for you. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus. Oh, Oramama Korito Yopopora Shandarama Satai. Jesus, holy name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Talk about clingy. One of the lines in one of my favorite old-time gospel songs that we sing here, you've heard us sing it. It's this song that says, I'm going that way. <laughs> I'm going that way. I can't sing that song without shouting. I try. I do my best sometimes because I want you to hear the lyrics. If I had a church full of people and I knew you could hear the lyrics without me, I'd be shouting all over the place from the first note to the last because there is not a line in that song. That does not mean something special to me. As a matter of fact, God's kind of inspired a message in me that I may preach in the next few weeks that will actually kind of break that song down for you and help you to understand why it excites my soul the way that it does, the, why it sets my spirit on fire the way that it does. The lyrics seem so simple. Most people hear it and you're thinking, I don't know what. Pastor Charles can be getting so excited about. And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know how you can sit there and not shout. Obviously, we're approaching the lyrics to that song differently. But there's one line in the chorus that I love. It says, I'll cling to him and never to stray. Hallelujah. I'll cling to him and never to stray. Oh, singing his praises all day long. <laughs> I'm going that way. Hallelujah. Oh, we ought to cling to him. We ought to struggle as God's people against anyone or anything that would try, listen to me children, that would try to take him from us. I'm not talking about from him. He said that once you're in his hand, once you're in the hand of God, no man can pluck you out. There in the soul in this world, that old judgmental sister at first church, that old judgmental condemnatory pastor over there at first holiness church, honey, they haven't got the power to pluck you out. The problem we have with a lot of believers today is not that the enemy has been able to pluck them from God's hand, but rather the enemy has been able to pluck Christ from them. Oh, but he serves such an important function. He serves such an important purpose in our life. We need to cling to Him and never let go because we need Him. He's doing something for us that's going to get us into heaven. And the minute we let go of Him, we no longer have the benefit of that. What is He doing for us? First of all, I'll point out to you in our primary text today, Galatians 3, 22 through 29, we kept reading the word faith over and over and over again. You kept seeing Paul refer to, we're justified by faith. He said, but before faith came, but before faith came, what is faith? Faith is in contrast to the law. The is not faith and faith is not the law you cannot embrace the law and follow the law and think for one moment that you're walking by faith you are not that's right we got a lot of believers who allow Jesus to be torn from them 
They don't cling to Him. They don't hold tightly to Him and never let go so that He might be for them what the Word of God declares He is. Listen, He says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Meaning we were reserved under the law. We were held aside under the law. Shut up unto the faith. Meaning reserved for the faith. You see, the law was only there to help keep you in place. Oh, hallelujah. Woo! glory until faith came. Hallelujah. The whole idea of the law was it would help you understand no man is holy. No man is righteous. No man is godly in the sight of God. All our righteousness before the Lord is as filthy rags. You idiot with your hair piled on your head and you think you're holy. You're a is before the Lord as filthy rags. Don't tell me you don't put a lot of your confidence in heaven. Put a lot of your confidence in one day seeing the Lord in the length of your hair, in the length of your skirt, lady, in the length of your shirt, mister. Oh, I don't wear colored shirts. I only wear white shirts. Glory to God. That makes me holy. No, it doesn't, stupid. It makes you a boring dresser. <laughs> Biblical idiots is what these people are. I'm not talking about people who live consecrated, dedicated, sanctified lives and as part of that, they believe in uncut hair and long dress. Honey, I don't have a problem with you. My problem is not with that at all. If you read your Bible, you'll see where when Paul really needed to touch the Lord one time, he shaved his head. Now, if some Christian man, Pentecostal man, comes along and says to me, I feel led of the Lord to shave my head and I'm going to, from this day forward, I'm going to keep my head shaven and I'm going to do that as an act of consecration and dedication to God. I have no problem with that. That doesn't bother me none. You're not doing it because you're sitting there like some kind of a nut claiming the Word of God demands that you do so and you can't get into heaven unless you do it and then you turn around and preach to somebody else unless they do it, they can't get into heaven. You follow what I'm telling you now? There's a difference between law and faith. There's a difference between doing something because first you BC told you you're supposed to do that right. and doing it because you feel... It's an act of consecration and dedication to the Lord. What people do is an act of consecration and dedication to the Lord. I have every respect in the world for. There are people who do all kinds of things as an act of consecration and dedication. Some people, they can't get up out of their bed in the morning, but they got to hit their knees and pray for an hour every morning before they, they start their day. Now, not every believer doesn't start their day that way, but they do. Why do they do that? Because they feel they should. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And I have no problem with that. Do you follow what I'm telling you, folks? You see, if you're living something because you love the Lord and you're doing it as an act of consecration and dedication, then God bless you. I'll take a church full of high hair holiness people, long sleeves and long dresses and all that stuff. I'll take it all day long. Riverside was full of people like that, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. Riverside didn't do it because because Church of God told them to. Riverside did it because they believed and pleased the Lord. And they did it as an act of dedication and consecration. And the move of God in that church, let me tell you, put any Jesus name church I've ever walked in to shame. God can't move around legalism because he doesn't operate in the realms of law. He operates in the realms of faith. Amen. Over and over again, Paul refers to faith. But before faith came, he said, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. 
Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster or our teacher, our instructor, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Third time. But after that faith is come, fourth time, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, we're no longer under the teacher, we're no longer under the instructor. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Five times in four verses he is referred to faith. Verse 27 he said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let me tell you a little secret. When the Roman Catholic early church fathers took the name of Jesus, the most powerful and the most important element in our faith, there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. When they took the name of Jesus out of the ordinance of water baptism, and inserted in its place in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something, honey. They robbed you. Paul said, For as many of you as have been baptized into who? Christ. Do you know what the Roman Catholic Church says about baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? They will receive anyone into their membership who has been baptized using the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They will not accept as a legitimate baptism anyone who has been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is Catholic dogma. You can get online and go look it up. They say we recognize any Protestant who has been baptized under the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We recognize them as wayward children of the Roman Catholic faith. But we reject as our offspring those who baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not a child of Rome. I'm a child of heaven. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. I've been baptized in the name of my Lord. Glory yes. to God. And Paul said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. Roman Catholic teaching says, when you're baptized under the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, listen to me, children, you are baptized into, listen, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That is their teaching. They, therefore, look upon everyone who is baptized, Catholic or Protestant, everyone who is baptized as uh, the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they see you as being baptized into the Trinity. Trinity, which is their core doctrine, their central doctrine. You can't possibly be a Roman Catholic if you don't first accept the doctrine of the Trinity. Therefore, they created this substitution in baptism. Go read a history book, people. Every word I'm telling you could be proven by history. I've told people this when I was preaching in New York City. I said, go to the library. New York City's got one of the best public library systems in the world. I said, go to the library downtown. Look up Christian history. Look up the word baptism. You will find that baptism historically has been uh, administered to the church in the name of Jesus Christ for the first time uh, two and three centuries of the church. It wasn't until the Council of Nicaea that it was changed. 325 A.D. All the apostles were dead. Those who had succeeded the apostles, who had learned at the apostles' knees, were dead. Those who had learned at the knees of those who had learned at the knee of the apostle were dead. There had been enough time passed that these men, claiming to have authority they did not have, were able to change 
changed the baptismal formula and they did so according to the Roman church they did so to help solidify in the minds of their converts the doctrine of the Trinity that is the whole reason why they started baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That is the whole reason why early church fathers changed baptismal formula from in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins to in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And folks got news for you. It's, it's historical fact. You can go read it. History will tell you. You don't even have to believe the Word of God. The Word of God tells you over and over again, but people don't want to believe the Word of God. Well, go look at history. It is a fact of history. 325 A.D., the Nicene Council, all of a sudden, the formula for baptism was changed, and the most powerful element of the ordinance of baptism was removed. The name of Jesus. Paul said, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, not into the Trinity, into Christ, have what? Put on Christ. Therefore, Christ becomes our covering. Christ becomes our cloak. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to hear me real good today, children. Jesus Christ, we put on Christ. You know, the Trinitarian churches preach that you ask Jesus into your heart. No, you don't. You don't want Him there. You want Him around you. You want Him enveloping you. Hallelujah. You want Him clothing you. Because His righteousness then is all that can be seen by the divine. Hallelujah. Oh my God have mercy. When God looks at you all he sees is the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Because he has become our covering. Oh, oh. The Holy Ghost comes in. Jesus came into my heart. That's what happens when the Holy Ghost comes in. But before that, when you're baptized in the name of the Lord, you put on Christ. Hallelujah. This jacket that I'm wearing today. Of course, it'd be double-breasted. I <laughs> can't get it unbuttoned. Doesn't that make sense? This coat that I'm wearing today. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory. And when I come out of the waters of baptism, I come out wearing Him. Hallelujah. When I come out of baptismal waters in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, I have put on Christ. Hallelujah. Haven't taken him in, haven't sucked him in. No, I've put him on. That should give you a little more understanding of what you need to do if you're going to cling to him. If you're going to cling to the Lord. Oh, I don't want the Lord removed from my life. I don't want anybody to come and convince me that faith in Jesus Christ, which I exercise in the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, that that faith is not what's going to see me through. I don't want anybody to come and try to convince me that i got to follow this rule or follow that rule to make it into heaven. I don't want anybody to tell me i got to wear magic underwear to make it into heaven. I don't want anybody to tell me that this law or that law or Leviticus this or Deuteronomy that is necessary to my salvation. I'm going to cling to Jesus. Hallelujah. Why? Because He is my covering. Hallelujah. I'm going to cling to my faith. I'm going to cling to my certain knowledge that it is faith that saves and not law. 
and anybody come trying to tear that away from me, <laughs> good luck. Because I'm going to cling to it. Tommy, come here a second. I've asked Tommy if he'd help me today to do a visual aid for y'all. I'm going to have him get behind me and just reach around me and cling to me, if you would. He's clinging. <laughs> He's clinging. He don't want to let me go. This is what most people think their relationship with God looks like. This is what most people think they're supposed to do to walk with Jesus. They're supposed to cling to Him in this fashion. But honey, that ain't the case. Now, loosen up. Do me a favor. Take the top of my jacket and try to pull it off of me. A little harder. If you rip it, it's alright. It's a sermon illustration. So you ain't going to get it, Tommy, because I'm clinging to it. Hallelujah. You're not going to get a thank you. You're not going to get it off of me. You're not going to, oh, hallelujah. You're not going to tear this covering off of me. You're not going to tear Christ off of me. You're not going to get me to surrender my covering to you. I'm going to continue regardless of what you preach, regardless of what you tell me, regardless of what you say. I'm going to continue to believe that my salvation is by faith. Hallelujah. And it is my faith that justifies. It is my faith that allows me to stand righteous before God. And true righteousness will be achieved one day by faith. Hallelujah. One day, everything that God has ever desired for us, we will realize and we will see. We will see perfection. We will see purity. We will see divine holiness. We will stand in His presence in the very image of God, the way that Adam was created in the beginning. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. We will stand before God once again one day as Adam stood before the Lord before the fall. But until then, our righteousness is by faith. Oh, hallelujah. In Romans 3, verses 20 through 26, Therefore, the deeds by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now listen, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets pointed to the righteousness that we now have by faith. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ unto all listen to this next phrase and upon all upon all them that believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, listen, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness, His righteousness, his righteousness, we shouldn't be preaching that God's people can be holy mm -hmm. and God's people can be righteous. We ought to be preaching His righteousness. Yes. For the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His 
His righteousness. You see, we ought to be celebrating His righteousness. We ought to be rejoicing in His righteousness. I remember a time when I went to church and I felt more confident in my salvation because I was in a church that told me I had to wear my hair a certain way. I had to wear a certain kind of pants. I had to wear a certain kind of clothes. I couldn't wear jewelry. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? All the ladies couldn't wear makeup. They couldn't wear jewelry. They had to leave their hair uncut, so on and so forth. And don't you tell me, don't you tell me that like Jesus said of certain men, he said, who had confidence in their own righteousness. Don't you tell me I didn't have consciousness in what I perceived as my own righteousness. Honey, I was there. Don't tell me. You might fool somebody else. You can tell somebody else that you don't go to church and feel like you're doing God a favor because after all, you follow all the rules and you're living according. I don't have a TV in my house, glory to God. And that means, I mean, God, God's lucky I come to church. I'm so holy I don't even need it. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. But he went on to say in verse 26, To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him, which believeth in Jesus. The nature today of our clinging to the Lord who is our righteousness is not what many might picture. While many would perceive a believer's clinging to the Lord like Tommy was clinging to me from behind as one person holding tight to the arm or to the, uh, the torso of another. The reality of our relationship with the Lord is very different. He is our cloak. He is our covering. He is our coat. Hallelujah. He is our robe. He is our righteousness. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then Paul talked in Romans about the righteousness of God which is by faith of, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all. Do you see? Our relationship our relationship with the Lord is very different than many perceive. He is our covering. He's our cloak. So when we cling to Him, this is how we do it. Not this. Clinging to the Lord is more like clinging to our coat or our robe. It's not at all like one person holding to another. We would struggle to maintain the Lord, or excuse me, we should struggle to maintain the Lord as our cloak or our garment, as He is our covering. It is His righteousness which conceals our unrighteousness. It is His sinlessness that covers our sinfulness. It is His perfection which hides our imperfection. But we must maintain our relationship with Him as our covering by faith in His gospel and according to the promise of His grace. Hallelujah. By faith. Romans 4, 1 through 8, What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertaining, uh, pertaining to the flesh, hath found... For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse 4, Romans 4. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you're doing all these things for God that you claim God demands of you, then your salvation is actually Him paying you for a job well done. It has nothing to do with grace. 
Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. Now listen, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, oh hallelujah, listen, that justifieth the ungodly. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, meaning without effort, without his doing anything, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, listen to this, and whose sins are covered. Covered as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ our sins are covered. Hallelujah. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Many in the world as well as many in the church will seek to cause you and I to set aside our relationship with the Lord. They will strive to convince you that your faith is invalid and your effort to walk with God is in vain, especially LGBT believers. But the key is to hold fast, meaning to cling. Hallelujah. The King James doesn't use the word cling, but when it says hold fast, it's referring to clinging or holding tight to the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone convince you that you must do what they say to be saved. Instead, hold fast to the grace of God by faith. Referring to his ministry, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, 11 through 14, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Listen, verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep or cling to by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Speaking of pastors, listen to what the Lord, what uh, the writer says of pastors in Titus 1, 7 through 11. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, greedy, money hungry, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Listen, 9, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So he said he needs to hold fast the word that he's been taught. Why? So that by sound doctrine he can exhort and convince people who are saying something different. Now listen to verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially they of the circumcision. Take a wild guess what he's referring to. He's talking about people who claim to be Christians who were still trying to convince believers they needed to adhere to the law. They were coming against the doctrine of righteousness by faith. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? 
He said, those are the people they need to be able to convince. He goes on to say in verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And when it all comes down to it in the end, half of these fakes are in it for the money. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. I'm going to add the word already just to clarify. He's saying, you know, what we've preached already. He said, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached already unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The writer in Galatians is the Apostle Paul. This is the same man who in our primary text today over and over and over and over again emphasized that salvation and righteousness are by faith. He said, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ is our covering by faith. We've got to maintain Him by faith. We've got to keep Him wrapped around us by faith. We cannot allow anyone to tear Him from us by faith. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is in you partly for the purpose of helping you to maintain your faith and to maintain your covering. Hallelujah. That's why God gave you the Holy Ghost. That's why Jesus said you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Because honey, if you need power for anything, you need power to keep your doctrine and your faith right. Well, I'm going to tell you, everybody thinks, oh, you need power to move mountains and to do this and to do that. No, 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 no. No, you need power. You need the Holy Ghost in your life to help you keep your doctrine straight, to help you keep your thinking right, to help you keep your faith right, because there's going to be a whole lot of people miss heaven because they put their confidence in the works of the law and not in the grace of God. Hebrews 3 and 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast or cling to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Oh, talk about clingy. <laughs> God's people need to be clingy. Amen. We need to hold on to this thing. In Hebrews 4.14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Oh, cling to it. Cling to your profession. Don't you let anybody change your thinking. Don't you let anybody change what you believe concerning salvation. The enemy wants to do that because he knows the minute he can pull you away from faith, he can tear your covering from you. And you will no longer stand before God sinless. You will no longer stand before God perfect. You will no longer stand before God holy. Why? Because you no longer have Christ wrapped around you. Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast or cling the profession of our faith without wavering. For He is faithful that promised. In Revelation 2.13 Jesus said to one of the seven churches I know thy works and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. Oh my goodness. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, 
where Satan dwelleth. He's talking about you've held on. You've clung to the faith. You've clung to the faith. Hallelujah. Revelation 2.25, but that which ye have already, the Lord said, hold fast, cling to it till I come. Revelation 3 and 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast, cling, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. We need to cling. Revelation 3 and 11, and I'm done. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast, cling to that which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Oh, I'm going to tell you, don't you let anybody tear your covering from you. Don't you let anybody tear Christ your cloak from you. Don't you ever put your faith in yourself. Don't you ever put your faith in your ability to be perfect or to accomplish certain things or to follow certain rules. Make certain that if there's anything in this life you cling to, it is the knowledge that, that salvation and righteousness today are owned by the church by faith. We will realize these things one day when Jesus comes. One day when the Lord comes, all these things that we have held on to and possessed only in theory, by faith, we're going to possess in reality because we held on to it by faith to the very end. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you today, talk about clingy. I've known people who are in relationships, and boy, I mean to tell you, you talk about clingy. That, that guy, my Lord have mercy, his girl couldn't go into another room but that he had to be right next to her. That girl, you know, every minute of every day she had to be all up on you. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you watching today, you know what I'm talking about. These people, you see them in, in restaurants, you see them in the mall. They're all hanging all over each other. My God have mercy. You know, he's holding one of her legs and she's walking one leg. And, and they go, oh, they're just so in love that they just cling to each other. They're so in love that they just, no, they're not in love. They're insecure. There's a world of difference between being in love and insecure. Well, I'll tell you something. One of the things I love about my relationship with my booby is my booby can tell me, and he knows it, and I can tell him. We can say to each other, I'm going to go to the mall, I'm going to go to this, I'm going to go to that. And we're like, okay, all right, well, I'll see you when you get back. I'm not sitting at home worrying what he's up to. I'm not sitting at home worrying about where he's going. I tease him all the time. But I'm not really, I could care less. I know I have confidence in him. If I didn't have confidence in him, I wouldn't be with him. Honey, if you got to be fearful of the person you're with, that they're going to be out there doing stuff and blah, 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 you shouldn't be with them because you're with the wrong person, apparently. And until you grow a little bit of confidence, until you start to have a little more confidence in yourself and you're not so insecure, you shouldn't even be trying to be in a relationship. I know people, I won't, I won't use an illustration, it's, you know me, I always come up with these horrible illustrations. I know people, they clung to each other so much that if she ate beans, he broke wind. <laughs> That's not clinging, folks. That's not what God's called us to do. He's not called us to hold on to the Lord as another person. He's not told us to wrap our arms around Jesus as though he were a separate entity, another person. No, no, no. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Hallelujah. Wear him. And don't let anybody tear him from you. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory.